From WHYY and Billy Penn, it is hitting season. Hey there, podcast pals. I'm John Stolness from The Good Fight and Billy Penn. You can follow me on Twitter at John Stolness. Coming up, Reese Hoskins comes back to Citizens Bank Park. Hearts were breaking all over the Delaware Valley as our golden boy comes back to a standing ovation. We're going to react to Reese Hoskins' first game back in Philadelphia since joining the Milwaukee Brewers. We'll also do a quick recap of the Cardinals series, just this homestand through four games as we are recording here on Monday night. And I've got a bunch of questions on this Phillies team that is running away with the National League East right now. And we're going to discuss some of those here on this edition of the podcast as well. Joining me, my good pals, Justin Clue and Liz Rocher. Justin Clue from Baseball Prospectus, as well as The Dirty Inning and Absolutely Hammered. That's over at our Hit and Season Patreon, which you can access by going to patreon.com slash hit and season. Justin on Twitter is at Justin underscore Clue. What's up, pal? Well, yeah, I'm just going to do it now. Um, do it now. We're going to get into a big <laughs> Reese Hoskins love fest in a second here. I'm just going to get this out of my system. I've been seeing an upsetting amount of comments. Well, I was leading up to this game. Jokes, certainly. I guess. All of them, for the most part. Uh, but enough that I feel like I have to say something. Uh, the, as we all know, Brandon Marsh, hamstring strain. He's the Phillies left fielder. Reese Hoskins is back in town. Phillies need a left fielder. Make it happen, Dave. I was seeing these like connections being made, and you know, again, jokes. I get it, <laughs> but I'm seeing a lot of history getting revised in general, but also specifically with the Phillies lately. Does either one of you want to take a gander at what Reese Hoskins' defensive wins above replacement was by the end of August 2018, the uh, end of the left field experiment with Reese Hoskins? Oh, uh, can't did, have been this, good. Defensive run saved, you're, 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 oh, or defensive wins above replacement, did you say? Defense, I, I defensive war. I will say he was at negative 2.1. I'll Elizabeth? say negative 3. Hmm. Well, you're right, Liz. He was not the best. Uh, he has... <laughs> I'm really afraid to, now. She nailed it. Yeah, she nailed it. <laughs> Tim, Tim Kelly's, uh, Phillies Nation's uh, Tim Kelly at the time, wrote that Reese Hoskins has been worth Negative 19 defensive runs saved in 2018. Oh, okay. He has a negative 10.6 ultimate zone rating. Okay. And Fangraph says that by a comfortable margin, he's been the worst, the worst, the worst <laughs> fielding left fielder <laughs> in baseball. In fact, his minus 15.7 defensive war nice. is the worst mark for any qualified fielder at any position in 2018. Oh, now, my gosh. Again, I don't say this out of concern for a real thing happening. I'm just saying it out of a concern that, again, history's getting revised a little more every day, and we all love Reese. You're going to hear how much I love him in just a little bit, but he's not a left fielder, and pretending he was just because there's a little LF next to his name on baseball reference sometimes doesn't mean all those numbers I just read got thrown out, okay? Just feel like that's that's worth sharing. I think those are good points. I feel like I've made points similar to that in uh, in recent weeks or months, and I've been told that I hate Reese Hoskins. Uh, mm. So I would just like for the record for everyone to <laughs> who's watching and listening to this to know that it was Justin Clue who brought up this information and not me. Um, nevertheless, Start the show. Nevertheless, to, I mean, just right out of the gate, firing mm -hmm. away from the clock tower at, at, at Reese Hoskins here on a night when I planned on doing nothing but celebrating the man. But, you know, to each their own. Uh, Liz Rocher from Yahoo Sports. Follow her on Twitter at Liz Rocher. Liz, what negative things do you have to say about Reese Hoskins tonight? <laughs> I mean, other than Justin clearly hates him. Uh, yeah. I I'm Logical conclusion. Are you how many of those people talking about trade for Reese Hoskins do you think no were? one's no one's actually saying no one's that, actually real. doing that because <laughs> I, I can't imagine they're this doing is that a fan base and saying he should play left field I wouldn't yeah. put it past them <laughs> would you yeah, well, well see this is kind of what I'm responding to without responding to is the um the apparently the Matt Klintak era and the Matt Klintak front office is getting kind of washed of Who is any doing kind of culpability. This? I was also surprised yeah. to discover there was a growing movement of people who just want to believe that whole time was sunshine and rainbows. It wasn't all that long. Okay. 
That's what I said. It was it, long enough. It was <laughs> less time ago. We can just remember it with our we brains. We don't even need yeah. to look it up. No. We literally just several days ago celebrated the two two year anniversary of the Phillies. Of, of the, the biggest momentum shift change in the last 15 years in the franchise. Yeah. Like. The Rob Thompson uh, switch yeah. to Joe Girardi, Rob, Rob Thompson, which, like, which we're going to get into in the show as well. Yeah. But it's just like we can. That's still within. It's not like Chase Utley returning, which people were talking about today. People barely. I barely remember that. When he mm. came back, you know, for the first time with the Dodgers. I, don't, I barely remember that. Like. This is recent. This is <laughs> the ink isn't even well, I, dry yet. <laughs> to Look, be f- let's now that's that we've got t- all the toxicity out of our system. Yeah, that's yeah. it. You know, that's that is that is it. Uh, I will say that the the Chase Hutley return when he hit a home run and people cheered, and then I think it was I think it was Rob Ellis on whatever show he was on was like, it's despicable that Philly <laughs> fans were cheering for another player, and like all that stuff. I love that none of that stuff was a part of this. Tonight was just an absolute celebration. It was a class reunion. It was like a guy coming home from college for the weekend and seeing a bunch of his friends are still there. It was it was awesome. It was honestly it was a it was a basically a perfect baseball game entertainment wise. Yeah, entertainment wise it was a perfect baseball game. The Phillies beat the Brewers 3 to 1 3 to 1 on Monday night in Reese Hoskins return and we're going to start off there because it was one of those games where the Phillies win. Uh they played well and yet Reese Hoskins was in the middle of everything. He was he was uh, he got thrown out at home after he stole second base after walking and hugging Bryce Harper at first base. The ovation of course, we're going to talk about that in just a second. And and Reese Hoskins went deep for the only run that the Milwaukee Brewers would score in this game off of old pal Zach Wheeler. So Reese Hoskins uh, got his dinger. Uh, The fans got to lightly applaud the home run. I was a little surprised. It was a little muted, I thought, the the Reese Hoskins reaction. It was a close game. Maybe if it was 10 to nothing at the time, fans could have felt a little bit freer to to let loose. But with it just being a 3 nothing game, then trimming the lead to to two runs, certainly the Phillies fans, uh, they didn't want the Brewers, they didn't want that to be the first step to a Brewers comeback. But at the end of the day, we got you got a Reese Hoskins home run. He got an interaction with JT Real Muto at, at home plate when he was thrown out and some some good natured stuff there. Like it was just clear, like it was a family member that was welcomed back to Citizens Bank Park here on, on Monday night. And the ovation at when he came to the plate with two outs in the second inning, a rousing standing ovation that lasted about a minute and a half. I don't know if you guys heard the Brewers TV call, but they were very complimentary of the Philadelphia fans. It was a goosebumpy type thing. Aww. And Whatever you thought of Reese Hoskins as a player, you know, whatever you thought about the decision to let him go, whether you were for it or against it, him coming back to Philadelphia was just a, it was a tremendous baseball moment. It was a great night at the ballpark. And it feels like the last couple of years, we've had so many of these emotional nights at the ballpark. Liz, last night, Monday night was, was one of them. A family reunion is like the best way to put it like i i was talking with my husband as we were grocery shopping earlier tonight and like we were in the parking lot and i'm like for no reason yelling and gesticulating wildly with my hands like he's a family member like he's just coming back to visit after leaving you know moving away and no one else uh, heard me other than my husband (laughs) but i felt good that i was able to get that out into the open uh because it is exactly what it is you know he didn't he kind of left in the best way he could have left. He didn't leave. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a like a violent parting. It was there was no bad blood. The Phillies simply needed to move into a different direction. They had, yeah. you know, a, a better option. And his time is, had run its course. I think is the best way to put it. And a different, you know, so a different there's no vibe than feeling. like when Jason Worth left. Oh, Jason Worth left today. and was. <laughs> There was no love yeah. lost there. Like he was, he was always comfortable being an outsider on that Phillies team. And I think leaving and reinforcing his outsiderness was kind of like perfect for him. He enjoyed it pretty much as well. 
Yeah, with Reese, you don't even have the. Well, he took the money instead of the. There's mm-hmm. like, there's no, no, there's no inroads there. And like the worth thing, I've always respected how when after he was like, I'm gonna personally make sure they don't walk down Broad Street, <laughs> and then later where they were like, Hey, that was like something a Batman villain would say. Well, you wanna, <laughs> you wanna walk that back or say it again? And he was like, You know what? I was in a lot of pain and I was on a lot of medication, and that just kind of came out at the time. And everyone's like, All right, cool, we're good, we're good. But some of these guys come back. They stand up there at the plate, and it feels like they they want to do the least amount possible while still acknowledging the crowd. You know, they're they're very they seem like really self conscious or mm-hmm. like emotional, and that's like just how it comes out. But with Reese, Re- you knew Reese was going to lean into the mo- like not because he's oh, pompous yeah. or anything, but Reese can just recognize a moment. He's just so good at that, and just the, the, immediately when the applause, he was like, "Yeah, I'm I'm definitely taking my I'm doffing my helmet." Yeah, walking around home plate. They're I'll not going to care about the pitch clock. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and if I'm if I'm Reese, if I literally it. am Reese Hoskins. Yeah, I'm I'm getting teary eyed when the cheers come out for my at bat, but I was honestly I was hoping they were going to boo him a lot more loudly with the home run, not because of like, but because I think that's what he wanted. And if I'm yeah. Reese Hoskins he and did. I hit a home run in Philly and I I'm getting booed. I'm in like I'm bawling as I'm running around yeah. the bases. Like that's when the tears are going to come out. But you know what's nice about a guy who was an exciting power hitting prospect who came up and broke a home run frequency record, whose trademark power spasms could carry your offense through a long weekend, who in his few chances authored a couple of the most memorable playoff moments of an era, was generally excited to be here and who made a home for himself here, who took it upon himself to be a leader and who was respected in the clubhouse despite there being superstars around who eclipsed him in fame, who contrib- he contributed time and money and effort to the Philadelphia community. His wife Jamie jumped in head first to Philly's fandom and made sure everybody knew she was in it with us buying whole sections of, of the stadium drinks at playoff games. Uh, it's got Hoskins. He never really made any trouble for anybody. He never made you ignore anything when it came to cheering him on. And his departure was st- statistics and roster logistics aside, genuinely just a bittersweet moment for the city. You know, what's nice about a guy like that is you don't have any kind of debate about what to do when he comes back. You don't have to talk about, are we booing to boo or not to boo? You just have to stand up and clap because Reese Hoskins was a great guy to have on the Phillies and he's just not anymore. And it's really is just as simple as that. You know, and I'll say too, going along with the great guy thing, uh, that really is a lot of what this is all about because he never made an all-star team with the Phillies, right? I mean, he never had an MVP type season, but he was a, he was a constant contributor. Like you said, he was the first of those trust the prospects guys that really came up after, outside of Aaron Nola, but, but the position player guys that came up and had the kind of impact that you were thinking he would have. He, he didn't have, he wasn't a Dylan Cousins. He wasn't a Tommy Joseph. You know, he was actually a legitimately good major league power hitter. And he had big moments in the post in that during that postseason run that turned him into a legend. Without those 22 postseason moments, I don't think we have this kind of a reunion. We don't have this kind of an emotional response. That bat spike moment, I think, was a was the moment that he went from being a good player on, on the Phillies, who may not be here long term, to I think dude just went legend on us. And coming back to Philadelphia, I, I really wonder if, like, is he the most beloved, like non all-star player to come back to Philadelphia, because I can't remember another guy that we have welcomed back in the anticipation of him coming back to Philadelphia, where he was kind of where he wasn't an elite level superstar type player. It wasn't an all-star type player, but you had this love for him that was real and it was legitimate and you could understand it. Well, didn't no Cesar Hernandez, is... wasn't he surprised that he didn't get a, a round of applause when he came back? Well, <laughs> wasn't yeah. that a thing? Like, there's no... He's really the first player that the that the fan base cared about in this, you know, this sort of new crop of players that had, had to leave. You know, he's the first one that yeah. left and came mm-hmm. back. And, like, you know, there be, people are being very complimentary of, you know, the fan base and all that. Like, I was thinking about this earlier today because Rolling Stone released one of their stupid lists of the, you know, the best guitar players of all time. And Jimi Hendrix is at the top of it. And my first thought is not that Jimi Hendrix is bad, but baby boomers are still in charge of that list for sure. <laughs> and I'm thinking about what they're not in charge of anymore. 
And I feel like, you know, questions asked, like, do we boo him? Do we not boo him? Like, how do we feel about his returning? Like, that is, those are questions from a different generation of, from an older generation of fans, an older generation of sports writers, that they just don't need to be asked anymore. Because baseball isn't that game. Baseball isn't that game where you automatic like the players on your team hate the players on the other team as people as human beings because they're on another team that type of hatred is on which on you know baseball was built upon that but that's just not how it is anymore so it you know people are like ooh, philadelphia is so nice like yes we are but i think in a way like a lot the fan base has sort of grown up and matured in a lot of ways well, after we fixed Trey Turner by clapping last year, I think a lot of people thought if we clapped for Hoskins tonight, his uniform would just like turn back into a Phillies uniform, and he would just the be back on the team. Of that are incredible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's interesting with in light of the the Bryce Harper not running out the ground ball in St. Louis. Oh no, in uh, in oh, where was that? In was it San, San Francisco? Francisco. Uh, the, all that conversation you did hear a little bit on on the sports talk radio. I think it was on ninety seven five the fanatic. But like, are we are we too soft oh, really? because of all Shocked. that stuff? Yeah. So that that still makes the rounds. You you still have you you still have a little bit of that. But I don't think I, I don't think you're going to get that uh, with with Reese Hoskins and the reaction those guys tomorrow were born on underneath on the, the table at Wing Bowl. Like, come on, those guys were literally born. At, like one of the most infamous. That's not you know, sanitary at all. I'm sorry. And why do you think those <laughs> guys the are the way they are now? <laughs> Born into a it's bowl of wing enough. sauce. Fair enough. Uh, anything else on on the Reese Hoskins return before we move along? Uh, just that um, you know, it obviously makes you think about whether they could have kept him or not i think we've all pretty much moved past that and honestly we all agreed at the time all of us even the people listening that it was the right move even yeah. though it was not the move anybody really wanted to see uh and you know if if they had kept him around they would have this other great hitter who we know fits in the clubhouse and he, he would just occasionally not hit a ball hard for a month and a half and so like if he's if he's still here, that means Harper was still comfortable and right. You find somewhere to stash or move Castellanos, I guess, was my conclusion. Because, like, he's not going to play left. He's played, like, 16 games in left in his career. So he's not, like, that's not his bag. Marsh takes left. Rojas is in center. Pache is kind of around. Given how slow of a start Castellanos has had, it's, you know, if you're just simplifying it down to what if Hoskins and not Castellanos was here, because that's probably closer to what it would be, not like, what if they were all just still here? I don't know. It's kind of, given how slow of a start he's had, it's tough to not see it as like a net gain. But on the other hand, it's also tough to say that the team with the best record in the National League and the first one to 40 wins this year could really be better off in this right. way. Like, they've done pretty <laughs> okay. The main thing I, that the Phillies would be better off without this season is hamstring injuries, in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, I think they made the right call. I think they've made the right decisions, uh, and I, I didn't see a fit. As I was saying it from the beginning of the offseason, there was there was no realistic pathway. Once Bryce Harper decided to play first base, uh, there was no realistic pathway to Reese Hoskins staying in Philadelphia. Now, he's having an okay season, obviously just back off the injured list. The batting average is low. The OPS is a little over 800. It's pretty typical Reese Hoskins season. Uh, he's about a two-and-a-half, three-win player, uh, and that's a, that's a good guy for the Brewers to have in the middle of their lineup, and if you could have found a defensive place for him on this team would have made all the sense in the world to sign him to a contract but uh just didn't work out but anyway great to see him back in philadelphia we'll get two more games here this week with reese hoskins uh just hope he doesn't do a whole lot of damage uh, over these next couple of games as the first place brewers come to philadelphia for this three game set and the phillies uh, jumped on them early in this game and uh take the first game in uh this series it's actually the 15th time in their last 18 series the phillies have won the first game of the series. I mean, that makes that is such a huge thing to get that first win uh, off your belt. And, and really the star of this game, we're talking a lot about Reese Hoskins, but Zach Wheeler uh, continues to shove. Seven innings, five hits, one run, three walks, six strikeouts, 114 pitches. Uh, they pushed him a little bit further in this game because he's going to have a lot of off days with this trip to London coming up. So it'll be a good, as the British would say, maybe a fortnight. Not quite that long, but um, 
Yeah, it's like a week and a half, Justin. I can see the confusion no, in your eyes. I was just eyes. trying to figure out if you were doing an accent or not, and I was going to say... <laughs> a, um, fort, a fortnight. Needs work. Needs yeah, it work. does. <laughs> my 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 wife not and kids now, they hate it when work. I do my British accent. They they just hate it. Fish and chips, governor. They cannot stand it. No, it's well, because it's you're not, not really actually one, but, yeah, a British accent. That it's not actually that. That's it's not, no, just it's not, not what it is. It's not. It's not. Well, let's move on. Seven and three. Zach Wheeler with Please. a two two three ERA so far this season. Do you remember he lost like his first? They lost his first four starts of the season. I no. think is what it was. I don't remember that at all. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah, that's they, they're they only just lost the first Ranger Suarez start of the season uh, <laughs> right. in his last start. Right. They're it's been a weird year. Ranger Suarez starts. <laughs> that's right. It's been a weird year. Uh, in 13 starts this year, Zach Wheeler has allowed either zero or one runs seven times. Seven of his 13 starts. Uh, that's uh, it's a pretty ridiculous start to the season here for Zach Wheeler. And, uh, of course, the offensive heroes were the usual suspects. All the guys that you would expect. Edmundo Sosa with an RBI single. I mean, he was one of those guys we earmarked at the beginning of the year to have a, a, an OPS clear and close to 900, uh, starting shortstop every day. Johan Rojas with an RBI single in this one. And, of course, David Dahl uh, comes through with a solo home run to, to right field. I mean, this is these are the normal cast of characters, right? These, these are the everyday guys who are coming in here and doing the job. So, you know, just more of the same here from this Phillies team that has no depth whatsoever at all in any way, shape, or form. Just the stars <laughs> continue to carry the load. The Dahl has it all. No. We're all going to be saying it this summer. No. Get, get used to hearing it. Yeah, the guy's a star. Already, he uh, he, he's he's made his call up worth it. You get one home run out of a guy who's like, well, he's doing well at AAA, and we need a guy, so get in there. And he's like, okay, and he gets on base twice. He gets a home run. He immediately is doing the shimmy. It's just like, okay, so he's he's just been here the whole time. It's always nice. You know, the Phillies have gotten... They've been smart. They've gotten lucky. You know, some of these guys who come along and slide in when you need them... This is not always the case. You know, sometimes you run into guys, it just doesn't work. Obviously, Whit Merrifield does not seem like something that's working out for the Phillies right now. Nope. But when a new guy pops in like that, it's always great on, like, the first night that he's able to make an impact. Because then you can just imagine, like, oh, man, what if this guy just, like, goes on a random heater right now? Mm -hmm. Like, that's just, as Michael Barkan said in the post game tonight, he was like, now he's just part of this season's story. Everybody's going to be like, remember that night? Doll came up and hit the home run. And it's like, yeah, that's great. That's what it's all about. God bless, yeah. Um, like, the first thing I thought of when I saw the David Dahl home run was actually Greg Dobbs, whose last name at the moment I could not remember. I'm like, Greg the pinch hitter guy. Um, <laughs> it's Greg Dobbs, because I'm just, I think mm -hmm. a lot about the role players on, you know, some of those teams, the 2008 team, the 2009 team and all that, that they came when they needed to do something, they did it. Like, I remember, like, a Ross Glowed unlikely home run. It might have been, like, in a Twins game for some yeah. reason at one point. Um, you know, that's what it feels like with guys whose names you've never heard just coming up and drinking a little bit of the water, and all of a sudden they're shimmying everywhere, and the home runs are leaving the stadium. And, yeah. Like, it remind it reminds you like it, are the Phillies so good right now that even like Jake Cave could have been nope. called what up from doing? AAA and had a better season. I'm just saying Stop. like he the, the, as the I said it doesn't always work. <laughs> no, sometimes some guys are just immune to vibes. It, it's but, a thing. You know? It is. It is. But I mean, this was. The, I mean, this this is all happening. David Dahl is getting the start in left field, obviously because of the Brandon Marsh injury. We haven't touched on that just yet. But of course, in the in the Sunday night baseball game against the Cardinals, uh, Brandon Marsh tweaks his hamstring, rounding second base. Uh, he said prior to the game here on Monday that it was a mild strain. He doesn't expect to to be on the uh, to be out for all that long. But he's on the injured list, on the ten day injured list, so he won't go to London. Uh, and Cody Clemens also hit the injured list with back spasms so cody clemens was the previous guy that they called up from triple a who was raking and continued to rake at the major league level he's the first guy that i thought of liz when you said greg dobbs i made that comparison with cody clemens a couple of weeks ago and oh, now yeah. david doll has to replace cody clemens who's going to try who's trying to replace like brandon uh brandon marsh or be like the the left-handed platoon part of whatever it is they're trying to do in left field you know it's the, the depth of this team right now everybody's kind of doing it with the exception of Whit 
Merrifield. Like everybody's <laughs> contributing when they're called up. And it's more than we got to see David Dahl more than one game. But I mean, the guy who was hitting 340, 416, 660 with 12 home runs in AAA. So certainly a guy was a former all-star in the major leagues. Um, you know, had a couple of really good seasons with Colorado and has uh, tailed off, obviously, in recent years. But there's some talent there, and they don't need him to do a whole lot. So, you know, it's they got Cody Clemens, who was on a heater, and he gets hurt. So, sure, David Dahl, come on in. Two runs scored, home run, solo, I mean, a single. Okay, sure, that's just the way this season is going so far. And that's how you know, that's what's going to, like, help support the Phillies uh, through these rough periods. Like, if it feels like... When they run into the inevitabilities of hamstring strains and stuff, it feels a lot like it, the team is, is less like cruising and more just trying to like jump over a creek from stone to stone. And tonight was like landing on a stone with a, you know, David Dahl hits a home run. Great. We got through tonight thanks to this guy who's here. Nobody's standing around going, hmm, what kind of long term expectation should we have? You know, you think like, you don't think like that. At this point in the season, when you're missing Trey Turner, when you're missing Brandon Marsh, when you're even missing Cody Clemens, all you're hoping to get from these guys who've stepped into their spots is any kind of production. So to get anything out of David Dahl is great. Tonight was great. We'll see about tomorrow. But for now, we're jumping to the next stone. And Liz, do you anticipate that this is essentially how they're going to replace Brandon Marsh for a little while in left field, a platoon with uh, David Dahl and Christian Pache out in left field? Because I don't think I don't think this injury is serious enough for Dave Dombrowski to kind of pull the trigger on a trade for somebody at this moment. It seems like they've got enough depth to kind of cover this for a little while. It was called mild, I want to just say today, given my <laughs> devastation at the news of Brandon Marsh's injury. It was called a mild strain. A mild today. strain, yes. Mild strain. Um, I, it does seem like this. it's you know fine to just sort of piece together a replacement, though I have been reading that the Phillies have reason to look for some new outfielders because their outfield has not been, mm -hmm. let's say, amazing. Or one of, the, yeah. one of many other words you could use. Good. Passable. Um, anyway, so I think it's fine for now, but I, th I, they probably want to address something a little bit more long-term later on, because as well as things are working now, there, they do not have an endless supply of David dolls. I'll say. I don't know if there's a whole lot out there looking yeah. at who, whose names gets, gets brought up right now, uh, that you would a respond so swiftly to Brandon Marsh going down that you'd be like, we got to get a left fielder in here. I, I just, I don't think that was the Phillies reaction to this, given the, the, the nature of, of, of his injury and the fact that Trey Turner gets closer to coming back every day. Like, and when he gets back, there's obviously another productive bat in the line or a bat that was productive coming back into the lineup. So Again, I, I you know, I, Brandon Marsh is a big loss, but I, I just don't feel like the Phillies are at the point where they're like, we got to get on this trade market. We got to think about who we're willing to give up. I just don't think they, they hesitate to get there because it would be at this point kind of a panic move. Well, when Trey Turner comes back, Rob Thompson has said he's open to the idea of Edmundo Sosa in, in left field or playing a corner outfield a little bit. And, you know, given the way he's sure. played, I'm I'm. I'm I'm fine with that if he can swing it. They tried him in center field uh, a couple of years ago, or was it last year? They had him. Uh, they dabbled with him in center field for a little bit. So, uh, seems like he's athletic enough to at least for them to to give that a go. Um, and speaking of Ed, Edmundo Sosa, uh, he did not win National League Player of the Month. Uh, for the month of May. Uh, that award went to uh, his teammate Bryce Harper, who we haven't talked at all about Bryce Harper, really. <laughs> I mean, just a little bit here and there. He's had a couple of hot streaks, but at the end of the day, you look up and his month of May was the best in the National League. 313, 407, 583, seven homers, 24 RBIs in the month of May. 19 runs, a weighted runs created of 174 and 1.4 wins above replacement. But I will say, Edmundo Sosa, I was kind of joking about it the other day. He has numbers where he could have made an argument to legitimately be the National League Player of the Month. 306, 375, 597. So a better slugging percentage, slightly lower on base, slightly lower batting average. Just three home runs, but he had like three or four triples. 13 RBI, 17 runs. A weighted runs created of 172. Slightly lower than Harper. The same wins above replacement, 1.4 as Bryce Harper. I don't say that to say that he should have won over Harper, but to say just, again, talking about the depth of this team, Fred Mundo Sosa, to put that kind of month together, replacing Trey Turner, it's, it, 
it's not the only i think the only trey turner month we've seen better than what mundo sosa did last month was last august when he when he went kill crazy anyway um oh i did want to mention one other thing uh about this uh, about this cardinal series um uh, Ranger Suarez, it does sound like uh, the injury not too serious to his pitching hand. Uh, it does seem, guys, like he's gonna he he could very well make his start in London uh, in the first game of that series. But on a level of one to ten, how scared were you, Liz, when when uh, Ranger left the game and uh, it looked like he was uh, like it looked like it was gonna be a little bit more serious? Um, I was panicked. I won't lie. Just like okay, mm-hmm. so all right, all right, what happens now? Um, and then I made myself stop thinking about it because I figured I would just, if I continued to spin out, just be bad for everybody. Yeah. I decided a couple of years ago, I'm not trying to diagnose people when they're on the field. I'm not trying to read anybody's lips. I'm going to just, I'm just going to wait. I'm going to see because, you now know, have things, a take. Your loss. Now, things are, you know, <laughs> especially when, when the worst case scenario feels not only likely, but like for me personally would be devastating. Mm-hmm. It's best to just sit there and be like, well, we don't live in a world where that's 100% the case yet. So let's just let that ambiguity, that cloud of ambiguity kind of sit over this until we actually know what's going on. And I did the same thing with Brandon Marsh. So to see him hit the 10 day injured list with a mild hamstring strain mm-hmm, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. was, was good news. You know, it was certainly yep. better. And then to see him laughing in the dugout today was like, all right, this is good. Meanwhile, Trey Turner looks like his brain's full of nails when, you know, when he's sitting in there out, out well, yeah, out of uniform, I guess. Uh, but in Ranger's case, it was, you know, I, I think I kind of just locked up for a little bit. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like a shout. It was just more just like, like yeah. that's the worst guy that probably could have happened to right now. Um, but the fact that uh, I feel like they described when he was when he came off, they, they described it as precautionary, like yeah. right off the bat. So I kind of used that a lot to just kind of calm myself down and be like, all right, look. I would take him out right now, too. The Phillies have been playing really well. They do have a good bullpen. They obviously weren't expecting to go deep into their bullpen tonight. But, hey, things change. It's baseball. I, I would I would take him out because he has obviously been so good and is so important to the future of this team. So, uh, I would say number numerically, yeah, probably about like a six, maybe yeah. as high as seven. You know, But I, I, was ready to, I was ready to wait and just see what the deal was. Because, again, also, the Phillies have just gotten – very lucky. Very lucky with injuries. This kind of stuff. Yeah. This year, so I was yep. I was hoping that luck just hadn't run out, and it hasn't. Well, when you when you, sometimes when you have a magical season, you do have that you do have that injury yeah. luck, and of course you did lo- they did lose Trey Turner, and they've gotten lucky yeah. with it. Mundo Sosa having the kind of season he's had to replace Trey Turner, they haven't missed a beat with Turner out. Um, one of the one of the very few things that hasn't gone well was is Taiwan Walker in the starting rotation. He struggled again uh, against the Cardinals uh, this time on Sunday Night Baseball. Uh, you mentioned the fact that Ranger Suarez they had to pull him and they went to the bullpen. Uh, Spencer Turnbull had three terrific innings in that game uh, after Ranger Suarez left and was one of the big reasons why they were able to to win that game after Ranger left. And I just don't know how much longer they can continue to put Ranger Suarez out there. He's going to pitch one of these games in London, which. I'm, I'm, I'm to our friends in the UK. I am sorry. Um, you're going to see some <laughs> offense, so maybe that's okay for you. Um, but I don't think he can stay in the rotation that much longer. I almost don't. I just don't really care about the innings limit worries with Spencer Turnbull at this point. I think he Turnbull wants to be in the starting rotation. I think he just wants to go and. It just it seems like the Phillies are doing themselves a disservice every time they put Taiwan Walker out there. He doesn't have anything. His fastball is two miles an hour slower than it's ever been. He, his splitter is getting absolutely demolished. He has no put away pitch. He has no idea how to get guys out right now. And, and when he does, he, I'm, it's, he should have given up way more than four runs because other guys were hitting rockets off him uh, on Sunday night. That just happened to be finding some leather. So man, I'm. I, I think it's. I think we're re- reaching the point where we we bid adieu to Taiwan Walker and maybe this start in in London let me ask you this Liz his start in London is that his last start for the Phillies this season even if it's good well no if it's good obviously he would continue so I guess what I'm asking is do you think he'll be good in London and hold on to his spot in the rotation I 
I have been a Taiwan Walker apologist, you know, not wanting to ask too much of him because he's a fifth starter and we've been we've been <sighs> gifted. There's been some gift giving from the universe with Ranger Suarez and Chris yeah. Sanchez. And so I haven't wanted to to be too hard on Taiwan Walker, but he has has not been good. I, I'm ready to say that now. <laughs> I'm ready to say that he has yeah. not been good. And, you know, Turnbull has continued to just, you know, shove, as you would say. He just continues yeah. to throw good innings, good pitches, and get the Phillies where they need to go whenever he's in the game. It would be a mistake not to try him again. But you know, this is not a, an organization that has held on too long. I, I feel like I'm still primarily reacting. This is a trauma response from years ago when the Phillies would continue to hold on to bad players um, and just let them go because they really didn't have a better option. Mm -hmm. I don't think they'll do that, but I am wondering I like how the, long of a leash they'll give him. I feel like the Spencer Turnbull pitching pitch limit uh, argument was for a world in which Taiwan Walker was kind of getting the job done a little yeah. better. Uh, now it does. I'm, I'm kind of with you, John. It's like, yeah, well maybe it's time to roll the dice uh, because like you said, he gives up a lot of hard contact, but I'm actually going to flip this around and say something a little different um, because, you know, Taiwan Walker has always given up a lot of hard contact. You kind of know going into a Taiwan Walker start uh, that he's yeah, that you're going to the ball's going to be flying a little bit. You know, the defense has got to be ready to make some plays and you're probably going to have to score you know some runs. But that doesn't really make it that different of a baseball game because I kind of think. We we might we might be stuck with Taiwan Walker for a while. Let's just imagine a world where the Phillies are just taking the opposite approach and they're thinking, you know, we want to squeeze probably like at least a couple more months out of him before we make any long term plans around Turnbull. I'm not saying I think they're going to do this. I'm just saying let's approach it from the argument that that's what they're thinking because you know maybe they are. He's making 18 million and he's at the back of the rotation. He's not great. He's not really even good, but he is acceptable. I'm going to say it. I don't look forward to Walker starts right now. I don't. I don't like watching him pitch. It's the same thing as Gregory Soto. I, if, if you can find, if, if you want to make the Turnbull switch, make it. But I will say in his post-game comments, Walker was talking about how his splitter wasn't getting the movement he wanted until like a few innings into the game, which obviously... No, I, you don't want that. That's, <laughs> you, you want it to work. Right, right away. Starts. Right away. But, that's, but he was saying that's what happened. Which makes sense, given that those four runs he gave up on two homers came on pitches that he tossed that were basically just baseballs begging to be killed. Yeah. And this is the part of this, this is the part that no one, including me, wants to hear is that if your fifth starter gives up four runs over five innings and the bullpen comes in and they are lights out, you should probably win that game. Which kind of like shifts the blame a little off Walker, which I think is totally fair. It's obviously easier to win when he gives up fewer home runs and his best pitch is actually working. But again, the Phillies have an embarrassment of riches in their rotation. Walker just feels like when he's giving up, like when Zach Wheeler gives up a home run early, he goes down 2 nothing early, you're like, all right, well, he can still settle down and like kind of throw well the rest of the way and this can be just a blip. And a lot of times that's the case. And even if it balloons into a terrible start, you're like, well, this is an anomaly. It's Zach Wheeler and his next start, you know, his next couple starts, he'll probably bounce back. And he usually does. When Taiwan Walker gives up two home runs early like that, it just feels like it's never going to stop because he throws those, those meatballs just dripping with sauce right down the middle. <laughs> and even the outs he records are screaming line drives that require, as they did in that game, solid to great defense from Johan Rojas and Bryson Stott. But he did adjust and the splitter did start to work, according to him. But like pitching wise, he retired nine of the last 12 batters he faced. He scattered two walks in a single over three innings, one base runner per inning. Because, you know, again, he's not a good pitcher, so he allows base runners even when he's not blowing it. Mm. So, acceptable. If the playoffs started today, I would say given who else the Phillies have around, Taiwan Walker really wouldn't have an argument for being left off the playoff roster. Right. But if your fifth starter allows four runs in five innings and you know you have a good bullpen, I don't know. I mean, that's... 
that's not as bad as it felt like it was going to be at the beginning of that start. I guess that's my point. Yeah, it, I think it felt worse because of how quickly they jumped into a hole. Like they jumped into a, a quick hole two nothing. And like you said, they've, that's happened with Aaron Nola and Zach Wheeler a couple of times this year. And, the, and but they managed to then hold it down. The Phillies tied up at two, and then Taiwan Walker the very next half inning gives those two runs right back, and that's kind of dispiriting. The Phillies do come back in that game, tie it up. Uh, they for the fourth straight time in extra innings, they fail to get the zombie runner home from second, and so these extra extra inning issues are a big part of the story as well for the loss on Sunday night. But um, wait, 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 wait. We got to talk about Jose Alvarado's <laughs> inning of that game. We got to talk about this yeah. baseball game tonight was a fun baseball game. <laughs> that inning was one of the best innings of baseball I've seen in a long time. Jose yeah. Alvarado has to cover first on that ground ball. And he, it doesn't look like he's going to He doesn't look no, like does the not. angle's going <laughs> to. And then he turns it on and he gets over there and everybody in the Phillies organization from the bat boy <laughs> to Dave Dombrowski is just like, he's going to, he's going to need a minute. And he's like, no, 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 it's, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm an adult. I'm a professional athlete. I'm good. And like the entire infield is already like halfway there smiling. They're like, Hey man, you hear me you okay? good. And he's like, yeah, like thumbs up to the dugout. I'm fine. You know, everything's good over here. And, uh, and then he, and then he immediately has to make a play on a bunt. And he makes the defensive play of the year, yeah. flipping it with his glove to first base. I mean, that was – and he had the exact appropriate reaction. Nobody mirrors the audience's emotional level like Jose Alvarado, yes. maybe yeah. Matt Strom, but Alvarado mm -hmm. definitely. And in that moment, it was just like, oh, yeah, we're definitely winning this game. They, of course, <laughs> did not. And you know, that he finishes it with a strikeout was even better, but it just gave those vibes – of Roy Oswald and left where you're just like, what is going on? Yes. The fact that he got, it's like the standing O Oswald got when that ball came out to him right mm -hmm. immediately for the, for, for the first out. And again, a game they ultimately lost, but felt like, no, this is going to be like a fun, magical late night win. And yeah. Alvarado got a, like a standing ovation for making that play at first. It was incredible. I had so much fun. I was like, man, Jose Alvarado is I got so much joy out of that inning. What a wonderful addition to this staff, this team and yes. our lives is Jose Alvarado. <laughs> so much better than we ever could have dreamed he would turn out to be. You're you're one hundred percent right. Just uh, what a lockdown what a lockdown reliever he is and just one of the more entertaining guys. I mean, just the, the chicken towels that, that he that he was making oh, is is, so good. is is worth it. You know, I want a, I want one of those. I want him to desperately make me a, a, a chicken a towel made out of chicken a chicken made out out of tell um <laughs> all right and, and just speaking of the bullpen what 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 did i say it wrong nope, no no you nailed I, it i want a towel chicken or so at least I what everyone's talking about right now is how how well you nailed that <laughs> Everybody is talking about that, are they? Okay. Mm -hmm. well, I, I um, really I'll, think that I'll just the mention, chickens should have been a Phillies fantastic auction auction item. How did they it miss have been. the mm. boat on well, that? A, menu item. a set of twelve item. Jose Alvarado towel chickens. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many places in your home you could use. That's to, you what could I'm use those. saying. You could hang them, hang them right back up there. They'd hang them right back up there. <laughs> um, and I'll just mention this, too. Uh, over the last 30 days, the Phillies' starting rotation has an ERA of 2.97. Very good. The Phillies' bullpen has an ERA of 2.06 over the last oh. 30 days coming into play here on Monday. So over the last month, the Phillies' bullpen has essentially been outperforming the, the starting rotation in terms of, uh, of earned runs. And uh, Sir Anthony Dominguez uh, is 0 0.93 ERA since May 3rd. Oh, he's just, back. Uh, he seems to be back. K rate's a little low, but he's getting guys out, and so you're happy about that. Um, Liz, you mentioned... <laughs> let's let's the, not dig too deep on the success of I'm not, not going to go Anthony into the peripherals of the Sir Anthony not. Dominguez bounce back. It's it's happening. I'm not looking to gift horse in the mouth here. Um, th this is where fan graphs can hurt you, okay? So you could, you don't want to go there and, and, and find some numbers that are going to say, no, no, this can't continue. I don't want it. Um... We did mention that this was today on Monday, uh, June 3rd, as we're recording this podcast late in the evening on Monday, the two-year anniversary of the decision made by Dave Dombrowski that really did shift the fortunes of this franchise when Joe Girardi was fired, Rob Thompson was named the interim manager. I don't think any of us could – we were all very – happy when Joe Girardi was fired. None of us could have foreseen the impact that Philly Rob would have on this team, on this roster. He is among the most successful Phillies coaches in franchise history, and he's been one of the sport's best coaches uh, over the, since he got hired two years ago. So 
in the two years, Justin, in the two years that he has been the manager, we've obviously seen him make some wrong moves, sometimes in some high profile situations. And not, and there's a, we always like to criticize the lineups. We don't understand sometimes why he's playing an entire lineup full of, of B roster players. Of course, with this roster, everybody's still been hitting. It doesn't really matter. What grade would you give Rob Thompson over these two years? Because he has his detractors. Every time something goes wrong, I see it in my mentions, man. People ripping Philly Rob. He's a liability. He's this. He's that. And I, I don't, I mean, I don't know what you're watching, what sport you're watching, how long you've been watching it, if you're coming to that conclusion with Rob Thompson. I think you're just seeing the people who are quicker to blame the manager and the manager just happens to be at this moment, Rob Thompson, it would be otherwise to, to zero in on him specifically. And to be like, well, he's prop. That's that'd be objectively asinine to, to, to blame him again. Like you said, this is not a perfect manager. He doesn't always make decisions. I agree with, but he doesn't have a big giant flaw that I would point to as this constant issue. The thing is, if you know, I, we disagree with the platoons and how he uses Marsh and everything, but I don't know if we have a problem with his lineups or his bullpen management, we can have them. But the players seem pretty unbothered, yeah. And so that means he's doing his job. So again, he's gotten some stuff wrong, but nothing that indicates some kind of fractured overall philosophy or competing, you know, thing that uh, that's given player one thing when the coaches are saying something else, and he's just like driving the team into the ground. He's got great players. He makes them as comfortable as they as they can be, and he's two for two and getting to the league championship series. That's pretty good, everybody. I know the World Series has been tantalizingly out of reach, but none of us are totally satis satisfied by that. But when you're evaluating a manager and you can say that he got you as close as the Phillies have gotten each time in his first two tries as a full-time manager, yeah, things are going pretty well. So I'd give him like a B plus because we don't, we didn't get, we didn't win the World Series. Uh, but other than that, I mean, I feel like he's, he's. Uh, if you look at it in in the uh, as comprehensively in the last two seasons and just generally how he runs this team, rather than focusing on like, oh, well, I don't like the lineup tonight or I don't like that bullpen d decision tonight. If you look at it more comprehensively, he, he's really been the best guy for this team. I, I don't know. I don't know if anybody else has the same effect that he's been able to have on this team. My biggest complaint is honestly, why why is it Philly Rob and not Broccoli Rob? Someone has to have come up with that. I don't, yeah, I don't know why that. Good like, how did we miss that? I don't know. I did. I, now I feel stupid for, <laughs> for us not having. It's been two years, and this is just now. This is just now popping into our atmosphere. <laughs> Yeah, when I talk on this podcast, everybody feels stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Damn I didn't want right. to say anything, Justin, but yeah. yes. <laughs> I'm so glad that you we're all on the same page. Um, I Liz, would also give I'd also give Rob Thompson a B plus, and something you said really stuck with me, which was the players don't seem bothered by it. Like the players love him, and that's what I yeah. care about the most. Is that the players? Are comfortable and I think we've discovered as fans we've discovered a lot about this Phillies team um, about how managers work in modern baseball in what exactly a good manager can do and what a bad manager do, you know can do to a team it's been an it's been an interesting learning experience for us and I don't know if any fan base has really gotten that same experience just sort of watching a team that had it had was it's the Wizard of Oz, a team in black and white, and then a team in full color. Um, like I, mm. you know, and that the players love him is even better because they've all just blossomed under his gaze because they all feel so comfortable, which is why everyone's doing the best they can, why everyone feels comfortable because they're they could just be themselves. Yeah. It's, it's the best Kirk. scenario. It's exactly what you want in a manager. And you hope you get that right on the first try. But the point mm. is to get it right. Yeah, he's not he's he's not one of those guys that you would have plucked out. It's like, oh, he's the 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 hot young mind. We got to get in there, kind of like the Gabe Kapler hire. Uh, he's not like the guy with all the experience in the world. I've been to a world. He's won a World Series like the Joe Girardi hire. 
it's just a good baseball guy who's been around for forever and has figured out i mean it was kind of like for Gosi with 93 like sometimes these managers they just they know the pulse of the clubhouse tim kirkjian on 97.5 the fanatic was saying on monday that the phillies clubhouse is kind of like a college atmosphere <laughs> like that's the camaraderie that's built and it comes from the, a lot from the players but it also comes from from rob thompson allowing these guys to just kind of do their thing and uh just the the difference between this clubhouse and the clubhouse that was smashing TVs because guys were playing Fortnite during during games is it's it's a complete and total 180. It just Henry's. to be fair, that's that's also very college. To be fair, it is very college. You're right about that. Yeah, um, that's. <laughs> it's a, I didn't make that connection, but you're right. But it's just there's just a level of competence around this team that other teams like the Mets, like uh, a number of other franchises would would die to have. And that comes that comes from the manager. I give Rob Thompson an A minus. I, I think, you know, the only thing he hasn't done is is win a World Series, and a lot of that isn't his his response his his fault. I mean, he's made some decisions that, you know, maybe hurt them in Game Six of the World Series, taking Zach Wheeler out. But, you know, overall, you have to look at the whole picture. The uh, these guys these guys play for him. He gets the most out of these players. And for all the griping that I do about the lineups, sometimes he's right. Probably 98, 99% of the time when he makes a bullpen decision, when he makes a lineup decision. And, you know, we don't ever really go back in retrospect and say, well, I guess I was kind of wrong that he went with all Pache and, and Stubbs at the end of the lineup because Stubbs hit two doubles tonight. And, you know, Pache <laughs> saved a run with a diving catch in left field. So, okay, you know, that's all just All we not... do is talk about the bottom of that lineup every night when the lineup gets popular. Like, Ooh, right. boy. You know, yeah. another, and we ignore Bryce right Harper having then... a player of the month uh, in May. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, then you zip ahead three hours. They're like, yeah, bottom of the order really carried the Phillies offense tonight. You're like, oh, yeah. Interesting, interesting. I guess they did. Mm. I guess they did. Um, last thing before we wrap up, Jim Bowden, a former GM now with The Athletic, uh, was uh, on a radio show or he was on something. I don't I don't know. But he, he said that three general managers have told him that the Phillies' number one priority at the trade deadline, which is, I guess, not too far away, a little – it's about two months away, so still a lot of baseball left to be played. But we're already starting to get into trading season here a little bit. That the Phillies' number one priority is outfield right now. They really haven't been talking to teams about the bullpen all that much, which if you – the bullpen ERA, again, in the month of May was 2.06. The Phillies' outfield – has been having its issues. Phillies outfielders here in 2024, 27th in wins above replacement, 28th in weighted runs created, and 29th in OPS. So clearly an upgrade could be had there. Brandon Marsh being injured, I don't think changes the calculus because, again, a mild hamstring strain, they're expecting him to be back. But even with Brandon Marsh there... He was their most product, uh, productive outfielder, but not lighting the world on fire, but still a good player. You're not going to take him out of the lineup. You'd like to see him play a lot. But Yo Rojas, uh, Nick Castellanos, of course, has been really struggling this season. He's had a couple of good games of late, maybe starting to pick it up. I'll believe it when I see it. There's just been a collection of outfielders. They really haven't been able to get a ton of production out of that spot. So um, I wanted to run a few names by you. Uh, I think I sent you guys these names, and I wanted you guys to tell me who your top choice would be. Would be uh, these are all outfielders from teams that I think we all know are going to be sellers here at the trade deadline. Uh, Luis Robert of the White Sox, he's missed most of this season uh, with an injury. I think he's back. If he's not back, he'll be back really soon. He has a career 825 OPS. Uh, Starling Marte of the Mets, hit with a 718 OPS, six homers, 23 RBIs. Brandon Nimmo of Pass. the Mets. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Jazz Chisholm of, of the yeah. Marlins, 755 OPS, an OPS plus of 111, eight homers, 29 RBIs, 11 stolen bases. Taylor Ward of the Angels has a 798 OPS, a 123 OPS plus, 11 homers, 34 RBIs. J.J. Blade of the A's has a 794 OPS with eight homers and 22 RBIs. And then Brent Rooker, who has mostly been a DH for the A's, but does play corner outfield, not well, but plays corner outfield, probably about the same level that Nick Castellanos plays corner outfield, <laughs> defensively anyway. But he carries a 921 OPS with 12 homers and 39 RBIs, and he made the all-star team last year, so not kind of it's not a fluky set of numbers like he's continuing to build on a very solid season from last year so uh justin looking at all those different names which one of those pops out to you the most which one do you feel is the most realistic here 
Well, those might be two different answers. To yeah, be they honest. probably are. I, so give me both. I never really know who exactly. I don't. Well, obviously, no one does. But who exactly? Dave Dombrowski's looking at among his tradable players and thinking, you know, this is we we are willing to go this far because. I'll be honest, I was looking at lists of names today and trying to get interested in in any of them, and I really couldn't get there. I mean, my short list had Taylor Ward on it. He's a breakout hitter this year. Angels have won a bunch for him. He's got this reputation as a solid everyday player. Is that what the Phillies want because he won't play every day? Yeah, I guess what what are they looking for Like in terms of playing time? Yeah, that's a big question. Yeah, you know. Like, he can swap stories with Bryce Harper about what it's like to get hit in the face with a pitch, which ended Ward's promising 2023 season last year in July. I'm sure they would and love he, to bond over that. And that's Yeah, yeah clearly Bryce <laughs> loves talking about it and thinking about it, if uh, if the Giants series was any indication. But, yeah, uh, but Ward had had an OPS over 1,000 before that mo- before the month, uh, in, in the month leading up to that injury. So, I mean, he's an intriguing name, but again, yeah, like I said, what what's what role are the Phillies trying to fill here? I mean, you look at a guy like the, the A's are said to, well, who who, won, who wouldn't the A's trade, but Miguel Andujar just got back from a torn meniscus surgery, but he's hitting almost 400 in his first eight games back for the A's. And he's a guy, when he was coming up, he was hitting homers to the pull side, but hitting doubles everywhere else, and his defense was viewed as, like, passable, and he was kind of looked as, as, as this new Yankees unbelievable player, and, well, it didn't really happen. He fell off a cliff after some initial success, and now it feels like, honestly, everybody's kind of given up on him. And that might be aiming a little low. And you look at other guys that might be traded this year. Kevin Kiermeyer don't need a defense guy. Need a bat that can play defense. Charlie Blackman, doesn't really solve your problem with a 679 OPS. Luis Robert, yeah, I mean, you mentioned him. He's he's hurt. It feels like a lot, and he's he's owed a lot of money too. Yeah, Joe Adele, he's just bad. Tommy Pham, <laughs> no, he's mm. having a breakout year, isn't he? Didn't Joe isn't Joe Adele having a great year? Or am I missing that? Joe Adele, I think, had like a hot streak, but he's hitting like two hundred. Okay, I missed that up. Okay, because I thought the same thing. Honestly, uh, I we can confirm. Yeah, two hundred one batting average. Confirm. No, you're right. Two hundred one batting average. Not yeah. not great. Two sixty on base. Okay, I uh, yeah. <laughs> cheerfully withdrawn. <laughs> Tommy Pham. Too much baggage. Nope. Doesn't seem to have a vibe that matches this <laughs> Phillies team. They would dump water on him during the post game, and he would have a full meltdown and chase them with like a broken bat around the field <laughs> as T Mac begs for some kind of sanity in his headphones. Uh, but honestly, the name you mentioned that I really hadn't thought about was was Jazz Chisholm. Yeah, that'd be fun. That would be mm-hmm. that would be fun. But that's what I go back to. Yeah, what are you giving up for that though? I mean, the Marlins are stupid. pretty stupid. <laughs> So you could get get Dave Dombrowski in a room with them and, I don't know, maybe just, like, hide a Jazz Chisholm baseball card under a can Your and they'll be like, well, where like did he go? Like, <laughs> a prank phone call might do it. <laughs> yeah, that's hey, right. Yeah, he's, he's here with us now. Oh, okay. Well, that is like how that, that, that works. Whatever you say so. All yeah. right. But, yeah, no, J- Jazz Chisholm is a very fun, dynamic, exciting player. He has underperformed, I think. He's suffered through injuries in his career. Um, but I, I, you know, I think projections for him were, were higher the, certainly than he's reached thus far. But the Phillies are that kind of team now, man. You send your Jazz Chisms our way, you know, it, hanging on, hitting 250, and somebody gets in their ear and says, "Maybe try this." Next thing you know, you got a you got a real live ball player on your hands here, and Jazz Chisholm would be coming in with a more raw talent than a lot of other guys do. So. Again, not sure what you'd have to give up for him, and I'm not sure really what role you're trying to fill in the long term here. I think the Phillies probably look to most of these guys probably closer to the trade deadline uh, and and see what they have in, in like the let's piece together quad A guys and see mm-hmm. what happens first. Um, but, yeah, boy, Jazz Chisholm, very exciting player. Fun to think about uh, mixing in with this outfield. Yeah, Liz, I guess you'd have to decide which of these Phillies players are you giving up on. Are you giving up on Rojas? Are you giving up on... You know, uh, Brandon Marsh, Nick Castellanos, you know, like if you're going to sign a guy, like, if you're going to trade for a guy like Jazz Chisholm or really a lot of the other names that I mentioned, you, they, you can't really sit them a lot like you're trading for them to play for you and to play for you a lot. So, you know, you'd have to you'd have to basically be saying either one of these guys is going to wherever in the trade um, or, you know, I don't think, I think if you could take Nick Castellanos out of the equation and replace him with Jazz Chisholm, I think the Phillies would do that every day and twice on Sunday. Yeah. Um, but I don't, that's, that doesn't seem realistic. I don't think that's reality. 
No, it, they'd have to send a lot with him. <laughs> I think they'd have to send quite a lot. Uh, and even though that's something I want, I don't think the Marlins are that stupid. Um, but I, I think it is Castellanos that would have to go. I, I love the guy, but he's just not been, it's not been good. It's not been good. I would miss him if he was not there, but how much would I miss him? Because Jazz Chisholm would be there instead. I don't know. I wouldn't put it past Dombrowski. I really wouldn't. I think if there's a deal to be made, he could do it. I think a lot of the argument comes down to, do you view this as all in on the World Series? And I know a lot of people are like, well, yeah, obviously, yes, 100% yes. But there's an argument to be made that the window's not like rapidly closing. Not here. at all. The, not at all. You know, so so it's it's not like you you if you really don't want to blow something up, then you aren't really, you know, there's no gun to your head. Mm -hmm. It's just more like how, how immediately do you want to solve this problem? How aggressively do you want to solve this problem? And I don't know. I think Dombrowski's kind of approaching things with a, a little more nuance the last, at least mm -hmm. the last couple of years, but you know, Hey, things change and we know what the reputation he had was when he came in here. Yeah. This feels like year three of a five year thing. Doesn't it kind of like Oh seven to 11, you know, with the starting right. rotation, like this starting rotation is going to be the exact same starting rotation next year. And probably the year after that, uh, the book, the lineup's going to have a lot of the same guys. Um, you know, the bullpen is going to have a lot of the same guys. Cause you know, they're, they're still about good baseball playing age. So you're right. This is not a, I mean, you are going to go all into a point here in, in 2024, but, um, it's just it's hard to see who gets lifted out as the Phillies are pursuing outfielders in trade. So that's why it doesn't. I listed all those names. All those names are really interesting, and maybe maybe there is a fit that that I'm not seeing. But you would have to give up on Brandon Marsh or Nick Castellanos or Johan Rojas um, in order for one of those guys to slide into a spot. And I don't know that that Dave Dombrowski is there. So we'll see um, what kind of names because we'll start getting names attached here as the rumor mill as the hot stove heats up uh, over the next uh, few weeks or so all right uh, let's finish up this podcast with uh, the usual are some final thoughts here uh liz any final thoughts from you to finish up this episode number 822 of hit and season i was pleased as punch to say today uh to see that our our good friend and co-host justin clue was riffing once again on twitter which is what i'm still going to call it um come back to us justin my days are boring <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, that's it's the a, end of my. Uh, that's a, the end of it. Come back. I'm bored, and you're very funny. It's a poisonous app that should be touched by no humans. You do not have and to I, look at I your am... feed. You could also do what I've started doing, which is just pruning. I'm just pruning. If if I have unfollowed yeah. you, please don't feel bad. I have to look at Twitter for quite a few hours a day, and. Uh, my brain can only take so much. I love all of you. Yeah. I'm in the same shape, Liz. I, I got to watch TweetDeck or Twitter Pro or whatever it is for, for my job for a good eight hours a day. So you do have to just kind of go through the pruning process a little bit. And it is, uh, it's, your life does get better once you've done that. Um, hey, Justin, final thoughts, buddy. I'll just blast through two topics we didn't get to that I have answers for and one was who's the mvp of the phillies for the first two months and i think it's unarguably ranger suarez oh, yeah. and moving past that who are the phillies all-stars as we you know get closer it's it's june you know it's the, yeah. the question will start popping up and we might as well be the very first ones to do it because we're innovators <laughs> here on hidden season oh for and sure i'm not I'm not going to, you know, just I'm just going to get the ball rolling here. I'm not going to list and break down everybody I think should be a Phillies all-star or who obviously is going to be an all-star and who's got name recognition and who doesn't. I'm just going to say this. In a just world where the NL all-star team manager isn't a guy who whoops a daisy his basically 500 team past a underperforming, to put it nicely, Phillies team in the NLCS and probably doesn't have a lot of love for Phillies players, in a fair world, even he would put Matthew Strom on the all-star team because he deserves to be. Of all the Phillies relievers, I think that's the right call. Absolutely. 100%. Zero seven five 5 ERA in 25 games. They won't Just be able to ignore him. 
Yeah, I, I was. I'm. I'm so happy to have been not wrong on Matt Strom because I didn't hate hate it, but I I didn't understand the signing when it happened. My goodness, he has been absolutely phenomenal uh, for this team this year. Uh, so I agree 100, percent Matthew Strom. And we'll get into the All Star stuff a little bit more as the as the episodes go along. I wanted to squeeze that in today, but we just kind of ran out of time. Lots of other good stuff to get to, so we'll address that down the road a little bit, uh, folks. That's going to do it here for this edition of Hit and Season again. One I want to remind you to go over to billypen.com slash hit and season. That is our landing page over at Billy Penn uh, through our good partners over at WHYY. I want to encourage you to also check out all of Liz's great sports writing over at sports.yahoo.com. You can check out all of Justin's writing at Billy Penn and Baseball Prospectus, as well as all of my stuff over at The Good Fight and Billy Penn as well. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll talk to you next time right here on Hit and Season.